Good morning, everyone. I would just yeah, urge you again, if you want to come again this afternoon, it will be a great service, uh, the baptism. Seeing, it's always a joy to see people baptised. Um, <clears throat> so it will be a, a great afternoon. But we haven't finished yet this morning. It's going to be a great morning. We haven't finished with our worship. God wants to speak to us this morning, I believe, through his word. We are going to continue in our series of Luke. I hope you've been enjoying it and reading it in your own time as well, getting to know him better. Um, Just to give you a bit of uh, news as well of what's been happening over the last week. First of all, it is my good friend Dave Gad's birthday today. Happy birthday, Dave Gad. He's nearly 50. Can you believe it? (laughs) Nearly. Uh, um, And also, this week, uh, we've been continuing with Alpha, and over the last uh, seven or eight days now, we have seen seven people uh, give their lives to Jesus who have been coming to Alpha. So, um, really, really exciting. God is doing great things, um, but we just feel like this is just the start. I mean, it's just the start for them, actually. In our church, we have to play our part in loving these people, welcoming welcoming them into the family and discipling these guys. But it's just exciting to be a part of what God is doing um, in Seven Oaks. So, yeah, very exciting. I thought you'd just be encouraged to hear that. Um, This morning, we are looking at, and over the next few weeks, actually, who Jesus is, that he is the Lord of the storms, He is a Lord of the demons and the supernatural world, and he is Lord over death and disease. This morning, what we're looking at is moving on from the kind of last section of teaching. We're in Luke 8, and over the last little bit of Luke 8, he's been teaching in parables. uh, But now we're kind of moving on to some action. We're in Luke 8, 22 today, from 22 to 25, quite a famous bit of scripture. Um, And over the next few weeks, we're going to see, as we dig into Luke, see Jesus do some incredible things. He will control weather. He will cast out demons into pigs. He will heal long-term sickness and raise the dead. So it's quite an exciting few weeks, what what we've got coming up. Today, Jesus is moving on from a different type of teaching. He's still teaching, but he's moving on from the verbal to the visual today. So let's read from Luke 8, 22 to 25, and the words will appear on the screen. So, one day he got into a boat, that's Jesus, with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this, that he commands even winds and water, and they obey him? Wow. He commanded the weather. So, verse 22, Jesus gets into the boat with the disciples and they set out. It's likely to be the 12 disciples and possibly women as well from chapter 8. And the boat that they got in was probably about between 20 and 25 foot long, possibly about the width of this stage as they get into the boat and go to cross the Lake of Galilee. Jesus instructs the disciples to get into the boat, knowing what lies ahead. He instructs them to get into the boat. And they're sailing, it says in verse 23, they're sailing across and he falls asleep. All of a sudden, this storm breaks out. They sailed and Jesus fell asleep. First of all, we see Jesus' humanity here, because he was a man. We, I think sometimes we can think about Jesus doing all these amazing things. Well, he was this kind of, he was God, so he went around doing these incredible things, but also he was human. He was fully man 
and fully God. And we see the humanity of Jesus falling asleep here because he was tired. Fully man, but fully God. But he was also God. He was Emmanuel. He was the word that became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But he was also human and he fell asleep. And the storm here descended quite quickly. And where they are in Galilee, this is quite a, a weather phenomenon that still happens today. So the Sea of Galilee is about 700 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by hills. And now, this is not just my knowledge. I've read this, so I believe this to be true. true. Cool air comes in, and it rushes down the hills, and it kind of swirls around the lake, and it collides with warm air. And it creates this kind of instant storm in confined quarters. So actually, this was <coughs> quite a surprise. Now, I've worked um, outside for the majority of my working life. And I would watch weather quite a lot. Because if I saw rain coming, I would go and sit in my van. <coughs> People often used to say to me, oh, you, you mustn't miss working outside in the, in the rain. Well, no, I didn't get wet because I would go and sit in my van. But, and, I could, and I could predict because I was in England and I was on a roof and I could see weather coming. But this would, could suddenly come in. This instant storm almost. <clears throat> and it must have been scary for these fishermen. Even experienced fishermen. Have you ever been in a boat in choppy waters? Uh, let's just, we've just got a little video to just give you this sense of feel of what it could be like. Let's hope it works. I don't know about you, but that gives this sort of knot in my stomach when I watch stuff like that. Because I, I, I think the, the sea and deep waters are things to be afraid of. Um, I, I'm not, it could be because I'm not the strongest of swimmers as well. I can, you know, I can manage to survive in a swimming pool and stuff. But the sea, <laughs> I think I'm a bit of a dead weight, you see, because I just sink to the bottom. Um, but <clears throat> that kind of puts fear in me. Um, this, this year we went on holiday to France and we got the ferry to, across to the other side and uh, I, I didn't think we were going to get the crossing because there was 50 mile an hour winds and when we got there I said oh no it needs to be a lot worse than this for, for us to cancel the crossing and we get in the, fer the ferry and actually the boat it was because it's such a big boat it just kind of swayed from side to side and it wasn't too bad um, but there was another time when we were on <clears throat> another holiday, and I'd just like to precursor this with, this was before I worked for the church and before I had children. We were on holiday in Australia, and we went to this small island, and you had to get this boat out to the island. And on the way back, we were on this small boat. It was probably 15, 20 people on this boat on the way back. And the boat was not quite as bad as that, but it was literally taking off and crashing down, taking off and crashing down. And, uh, yeah, I was, I was sitting down and just, yeah, cool. yeah this, is, this is not great. <clears throat> and there were people being sick in the boat. And Gemma was looking out going, oh, this is fun, isn't it? <clears throat> I said, no. I said, Gem, we are in shark-infested waters. <laughs> and the boat's going from side to side. And she said, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. <clears throat> it was scary. But the boat is filling with water in this story. I mean, that's not great, is it? The, uh, when you're in a boat, it's not really supposed to have water in it. The water's supposed to be on the outside. Have you ever been in a boat that's starting to fill with water? It's not a great experience. <clears throat> Have you ever been in that situation where you've called out in fear? Because I think if I was these guys, I would be calling out in fear. And, it, you know, there's kind of manufactured fear as well. There's real fear and there's manufactured fear. There's fear where we can go on 
roller coasters at theme parks and stuff. I mean, who likes rides? I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of roller coaster rides. I kind of like the controlled element of, of that fear. I think C is my, possibly my main fear we're discovering this morning. Um, <clears throat> you know, and there's bungee jumping. Never really fancied that. Always worried about my internal organs for some reason in there. Um, or there's, there's fear when we watch kind of slightly edgy, scary stuff on TV or films. I'm not, also not a fan of horror films. I, I don't think that does your soul very good, to be honest, to watch horror films. Um, and, but that's a kind of controlled fear, really. We can turn the TV off and we can not go on the ride. Um, you can go and make a cup of tea, and that's all controlled fear. But this is real fear. That, that's not true fear, like when I was on the boat. That was scary. But this here, what the disciples are experiencing is fear. Wind is okay when you're indoors, isn't it? When you're looking on the outside and looking at the trees blow around. But when you're outside in strong wind, it's a different matter. Or maybe when you're on a plane, that's a different matter. I'm sure Graham could tell us a few stories about that. But <clears throat> actually, I think I've been less scared on a plane in serious turbulence than I was on the boat. I don't know what that says. Um, don't know. <laughs> but that's, there's real fear that is beyond your control. And it's because you're coming up against something greater and more powerful than yourself. And this is where the disciples are. They are fearing for their lives. There's this windstorm. In Matthew 8, in the same story, um, so Matthew 8 and Mark 4 tell the same story. It says there's a great storm. And end of verse 23 says, they are in danger. Verse 24, we start to see a real contrast between the disciples and Jesus. The disciples are seeing the circumstances, the wind and the waves, and they are panicking while Jesus is asleep. It says in Mark 4 that he slept on a pillow which is also, we know, would have been common because they would have, might have had a pillow there whilst the fishermen would have taken it in turns to fish throughout the night. But he's awoken. In, in Mark 4, as the disciples are trying to wake him, and they say, do you not care? But when Jesus is waking up, he's not waking up to comfort the disciples. He's waking up to demonstrate that he is king. He is Lord over everything. And then you start to see a shift at the end of this story of the disciples going from being scared of the storm to being scared and in awe of the king of the storm. Right back in the Old Testament, we see that God is in charge. In Psalm 107, from verse 23 to 30, it says, Some went down to the sea in ships doing business of the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven and they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. They cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Psalm 135 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in all the seas and all deeps. He it is who makes the clouds rise at the end of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, and brings forth the wind from his storehouses. He has it all in control. Jesus has this in perspective in this story. He's sleeping and he wakes up, sees them panicking, he doesn't see the storm. It's like when sometimes my, I've got three children, sometimes they will call out to me in distress, and it sounds really bad what's going on. I might be in the other room, I might, they might be outside. They'll call to me, Dad, Dad, come quick! And I'll, come, and I'll run into their room, and I'll run into, say, my girl's room, and they'll say, they're, and they're screaming and they're standing on their bed, and there's a tiny little spider on, on their side. They said, get rid of the spider. 
And I, I get rid of the spider in an... I'd be pleased to know I don't squash the spider every time. Depends how big it is. <laughs> I, I'll get the spider and I'll just flick it out the window. See, I have it in perspective. But they see this thing. Ah! And they're scared and they're crying out. I get rid of it in an instant. And Jesus rebukes the wind in an instant. In in Mark 4, he says, be still. And all of a sudden, the perspective of the people in the boat changes. There's a key question, verse 25. Jesus says, where is your faith? And the disciples ask, then who is this? Who is this that he commands even the wind and the water? Also, in Mark 4, it says they were filled with great fear after he did that. They were afraid of the wind of the waves. Now they're terrified of Jesus. Who is this that commands weather? Afraid of the wind, but terrified of the king of the wind. And if you're with someone who can silence wind and waves, I think it's far scarier than the waves and wind itself. So you might have legitimate fears about many things. Ones that might actually bring you harm. But there's nothing as scary as the one who controls all weather. Jesus is more frightening than the hurricane because at his command, it all stops. This is Jesus who can make all other fears disappear. The wind and waves and the disciples realize that Jesus is greater. There's a a fear here, but it's mixed with delight. And it's a different type of fear because Jesus is more powerful. He's more powerful than nature. And there's, there's a sense of awe that comes. He's the one that made it all. He's the one that can silence it all. He's the one that can save you from your fears. It's like um, at the end of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe where Lucy is seeing Aslan walking away. And they, she's talking and she, sit, she knows that he's not a tame lion. He's the one that has ultimate power over the white witch. He is to be feared with awe and reverence. You're, if you've read the book or watched the movies, <clears throat> you might be scared of the... Or the kids might be scared of White Witch in Narnia because she's trying to kill and destroy everything. But Aslan, when Aslan roars, she turns and runs. Because there is fear in the one who has ultimate power and authority. It says the, the disciples, and it, the disciples are now experiencing this in the boat. It says they were marveled. And they're in that place of calling out, Master, Master, what's going on? Because they're looking at the wind rather than the king of the wind. The one who has authority over it. He can use that power to save you from your fears and deliver from you. And, you know, some things on face value can be scary or daunting. But in the light of the one who made everything... Fear him. Fear him who loves you. He has the power to deliver and bring life out of death. Jesus rebuke, asking the disciples, where is your faith? He is doing a discipleship masterclass here. He is looking here for applied faith. When the pressure comes, where is your faith? It's easy, isn't it, to follow Jesus when the waters are smooth? Oh, yeah, this is good, yeah. But when things get rough, how does your faith function? Do you know that he's always in control? It's so tempting, isn't it, to take back the controls when things get rough. Well, I haven't really heard from Jesus. I don't really know what's going on. I'm just going to take my own way with this. I'm just going to do this because I I think this is the right thing to do. I'm just going to take back the steering wheel. 
for a bit here, Jesus, because uh, I'm not really hearing from you right now, and I'm just going to do this. And the waves seem really choppy at the moment, so I'm just going to do this. It's so easy to slip into that. When we go through the storms of life, we can think God has lost control. But Jesus controls the history of the world as well as your personal destiny. We can often think that Jesus is asleep. And it can be so disappointing. There might be times when you think it is all is lost. There'll be another time later in the gospel when the disciples think all is lost. And they think that he is asleep, fully asleep, forever. On Good Friday. And, they, and it's looking like ultimate defeat with Jesus on the cross. They pinned all their hopes on him. And now they've lost him. I, I, I thought he was going to change everything. But then they find out three days later. Glorious resurrection. But isn't that like us? We can slip into disappointment. Into cynicism. Like it says in Mark 4. Don't you care? Jesus, what's going on? Don't you care? And that can happen to us all. It's happened to me. <clears throat> but the antidote, antidote to fear is faith. To trust in him because he controls everything. Sometimes we don't understand. But he sees from beginning to end. See, the disciples, they've spent time with Jesus. They've listened to Jesus' teaching. They've seen some of the things he's done so far up to this point in Luke. But now, now they are really starting to see who he is. And they are in awe of him. Wow, he controls this. Have you spent time with him? Long enough to know that he is Lord over everything? Everything. Do you react badly when pressure comes? Or do you lean into Jesus? Do you listen to the sound of the wind or to the voice of the one who controls and calms the wind? See, Jesus sees the storm inside of the disciples as the greatest storm. And that's what has to be dealt with. That's the storm that he's really concerned about. The way the disciples react, the way that we react when sickness comes, when relational difficulties come, when financial pressures come that trigger fear and anxiety, which says, I cannot trust you. Jesus is showing he is Lord, that he is greater than it all. Until we understand that, until we remind ourselves of who he is and what he's like, becoming more impressed with Jesus than the waves, we will constantly quake, we will constantly panic, we will have fear and anxiety. I have been so aware over the last few weeks of anxiety just becoming more and more prevalent today, in today's society, with young people. So many young people have anxiety these days. It is everywhere. Because people have got their eyes on the waves and the wind and not he who controls the waves and the wind. Anxiety is everywhere. But Jesus is showing here, he's working all things together for our good and for his glory. See, we look at our problems, we look at our health, our relationships, our money, and we can focus on that, but Jesus is looking at the problem and the storm inside He's looking at the unbelief. He's showing he is bigger. It, again, it, in Mark, it says, when, when he rebukes the, the, the storm, it says there's a great calm. Have you ever seen a great calm? That's what he wants to have in you, a great calm. You can cast all your burdens on him. Fear not, for I will be with you, he says. 
You might even be in a storm now and you don't know Jesus, but you can call out to him. Jesus ultimately came to calm the storm between God and man because there was a great separation. And he came to reconcile us because in Romans uh, it says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin are death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Jesus, you can receive that free gift. Sin separated us, and justice had to be paid for our crimes against God and his holiness. Jesus took it all on the cross so that we can be free. We looked at that this week in in Alpha, and we looked at the verse in Isaiah 53. It says, all have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all so that we could be free. So the storm, the, the iniquity was gone, the separation was gone at the cross. And you can come to him, you can call out to him, and he will come. If you're asking, who is Jesus? He's Lord over everything. Every situation. He's brought you here today. And you can come to him today. And if you haven't ever come to him before, then you can come to him right now. And he wants to calm the storm within. And I'm just going to pray right now. And you can just repeat it after me, just in the quietness of your heart. If you want to do that. So why don't we just bow our heads for a moment. And I'm going to pray. And if you want to do that, if you want to come to Jesus and he calmed the storm in you for the first time, if you want to say, yep, I've been looking at him, I've been asking who he is, and now I want to come to him, you can just pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the things I've done. Please forgive me. And I now turn from everything that I know is wrong in my life. Thank you that you died on the cross for me so that I could be forgiven and set free. Thank you that you offer me forgiveness and the gift of your spirit, which I now receive as a gift. Please come into my life by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer <clears throat> for the first time, we've got these little white Jesus booklets on the information stand at the back, and I just encourage you to take that home with you and read and help you understand um, what has just happened. But also, if you're in a storm, you can come to him. You can call out to him and see that he is bigger. See that he has authority. You see, living under the authority of Jesus is good news. It's not a have-to moment. I've got to follow him now. I've got to do the things he tells me to do in this book. It's not, it's not that. It's not a suppose so moment. It's a wow. The guy that controls weather, the guy that casts out demons and heals the sick wants me to follow him. That's amazing. What Ancha prayed this morning, you know, it, it, it's so easy just to pray he's here with us. He, the creator of the universe, is here with us now. And we get to follow him. He calls me by name. He plucked me out of the darkness. He plucked me out of my, my pit of sin and rebellion and chose me and set my feet on solid ground. He calls you by name. He knows everything about you. And he says, follow me. It's not a have to moment. And sometimes we have to die to things and surrender to things. Sometimes we have to acknowledge that he is Lord over everything and not focus on the wind. 
He calls you by name. He's not our pet either. He's not someone that we can just call on at a time of trouble. Oh, something's... Jesus, come on, uh, some, something's coming wrong now. Can you come now? No, he's, he's Lord over everything. He wants to be in your every part of your life. And actually, when you start to do that, when you let him sort of flow into every area of your life, that's when you find a peace that surpasses all understanding. Not just when, oh, I'm not sure what's happening here. I might pray now. Or I'll just throw some arrow prayers up on the way to work. Or I'll just say grace at dinner time. Or I'll just say a quick prayer before bed. No, he wants in every area of your life. And he wants to calm the storm within. That's what he's concerned about. You, he doesn't promise to remove all troubles, all difficulties. No, there will always be storms. There will always be waves around you. But he says, I'm coming to calm the storm within. Come to me and I will give you peace. I will give you rest. He is greater. Jesus is greater. Let's ask the band to, to come back up now. Because only he can make you dwell in safety. In Psalm 4, 8, it says, In peace I will both lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will make me dwell in safety. Only he can bring you that peace. Why don't we stand and pray? Only he will see you through the storm. Only he can calm the storm. Only he will bring you everlasting life. I don't know what storms some of you might be facing this morning. But he wants to calm the storm within to help you deal with the storms from on the outside. And I'm just going to pray right now that he will come and meet with you. He will come and bring peace. Lord Jesus, will you come right now? Come, Holy Spirit. Meet with us afresh. Thank you, Lord, that you calm storms. Sometimes, Lord, you do even calm the storms on the outside as well. Lord, whatever situations we might be going through, we just want to acknowledge that you are greater that you have authority over all things and we ask you to come right now. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning to come and give them peace that surpasses all understanding. No matter what they're going through, will you come and bring them peace? Come, Holy Spirit. I feel like this might be a significant moment for, for some of you here this morning because there is a storm raging on the inside and he wants to say, peace. He wants to say to you this morning, are you listening to the sound of the wind or are you listening to my voice? Lean into him. Lean into him right now. Come, Holy Spirit. We're going to worship now. Fix your eyes upon him. The one who has authority over all storms. The Lord over everything. And just as we worship, um, if you want prayer for anything like that this morning, then we'd love to pray for you at the front because he wants to meet with you he wants to bring you peace he wants to calm the storm within let's worship <laughs>